I have to tell you, I'm honored to be joined today by Kevin Lace. He is the author of The Last Punisher, a SEAL Team 3 sniper's true account of the Battle of Ramadi. He served with SEAL Team 3 as a sniper, breacher, and a medic on two combat deployments in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He received a Bronze Star with Valor and two Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medals for his service. He served with Chris Kyle, the subject of the movie American Sniper, and he also starred in that movie playing himself. And he joins me on the podcast to talk about his real experience serving in the Iraq War, about his experience on American Sniper, about Chris Kyle and the other members of SEAL Team 3 that he served with, about veterans' issues, and a charity that he has, Hunting for Healing. Kevin, thanks for coming on the podcast. Bruce, thanks for having me. Every war generates a few significant books. For the Civil War, and we talked about on the podcast, The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane is one of those that just makes soldiers who served in the war weep because it was so vivid. I think the competition will be open for the Iraq War about which book will rise and, and give readers the real picture of the war because it's sorely needed. And I believe your book is a contender, and I think it's a significant contribution. But you note in the in the book how there was a time where you were a Mohawk sporting college student and you transformed yourself into a decorated Navy SEAL and now a uh, physician assistant and public speaker. Can you describe the, the change? I appreciate you uh, you putting our book up there with, uh, with some of the best. You know, we wanted to tell a real war story, um, something that, you know, doesn't doesn't walk the line of embellishment or um, hyperbole. And we wanted to give the reader a true sense of what it's like to be in combat. And I think uh, some books out there, particularly some SEAL books, you know, state that I'm, I'm a badass and there's no way you're going to be this person. And I don't think that's necessarily true all the time. Um, so we wanted to tell that real war story. But, you know, my my transformation i guess it's more of a transformation than really um you know a, a change uh it's a change to some degree but I, I i've always had characteristics there that um you know have led me to where i am in life but you know i, I wanted to uh growing up i grew up in connecticut in a very small town and um, both my parents worked very hard to put me and my two brothers to school and n- none of them had gone to a four-year school and i i wanted to be different and go to college and become a doctor and I did well in undergrad and got a spot at James Madison University in Virginia, uh, where I was a triple major with, um, you know, chicks, booze, and rugby. And my first semester's GPA was a 0.7. So, you know, if you look at that compared to being a SEAL, you know, I definitely wasn't excelling my first semester. My parents definitely uh, you know, did not feel that like I was excelling. And I had a change in my life and it wasn't, you know, a wake up call from a couple of failed grades. It was more deeper than that. It was 9-11 that, you know, hit me pretty close to home. My, my friend's father was killed in the trade center and being located in, in Virginia, you know, a lot of classmates and family members that were at the Pentagon. And I looked at my lot in life and where I was and asked myself, was I maximizing you know, my experiences and was I being as good as my potential um, has told me in the past? And the answer was no. So I went down to the recruiting office um, after my friend's father's memorial service and looked at the wall and saw a poster on the wall and saw a SEAL poster particularly, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a Navy SEAL um, for the sole reason to go down range and engage the enemy. It kind of took some people as a shock, you know, that, that, that I wanted to be a team guy, but, you know, I looked at what I was doing, or rather what I wasn't doing, and it wasn't good enough for me. And I saw an outlet as being a, being a SEAL. And uh, the training's intense. You talk about that a lot in the book, but it has two components. One is to really transform you and sharpen your skills. But the other is to weed people out who just aren't going to be Navy SEALs. 
Yeah, you know, I really didn't want to dedicate too, too much of the book to the training because it's been done. You know, they've skinned the cat a million times. Um, I don't want to do a million and one. So I kept it kind of brief, you know, um, but the training is it's intense. Um, it helps weed out the 85 percent of those who aren't supposed to be there. And um, I mean, that's no disrespect for those who don't make it through SEAL training. Um you know, I know a lot of guys who've gotten out who haven't made it through training that have done very well with their lives. And there's no less of a, you know, you're no less of a man if you don't make it through SEAL training. You know, it's a, it's a volunteer service on top of a volunteer military. The teams, particularly basic underwater demolition SEAL training, makes you tap into qualities that you possess that a lot of others suppress. And um, I think those qualities are the ones that make you exceptional in instances that it's needed. Uh, particularly combat. And I I feel like I've always had a lot of those characteristics, use them a little bit, but not to the degree that the, that the SEAL teams required. Um, And it was buds that brought a lot of those to the surface. And a lot of those, which I carry to this day. Your complete training was about four years before you were then deployed to Ramadi. Yeah. That's frustrating. (laughs) You know, when you (laughs) join right after 9-11 and you, you want to get to war and you're stuck in training school after training school, uh, you know, I finished buds. I, I had a back injury. I got rolled back um, two months and finished with the follow-on class, class 246. Then I went to jump school with the Army, learned basic static line, and then went to SEAL qualification training, which is, you know, basic, uh, almost like infantry combat infantry school for uh, for the Navy. You get a bunch of sailors who had never really patrolled or done a lot of these things, and you tend to build on these basics. Um, and following SEAL training or SEAL qualification training, I went to um, – the Army 18 Delta Medic Program, the Special Operations Combat Medic, whereas, you know, the majority of our class went to East and West Coast SEAL teams, and I was sent to yet another school. And, you know, as a uh, 21-year-old kid at that time, I was frustrated. I wanted to be at a platoon. I wanted to go to combat, and I had my peers going and doing that, and I was stuck at another school. But I learned at that school, in addition to the basics of combat medicine under fire, I learned characteristics about myself, and that's ownership in stressful situations and, and being calm in stressful situations that have helped, you know, help me get to where I'm at as a physician assistant, you know, in medicine now. Um, so all wasn't lost in those seven months. Um, and following that training, I went to SEAL Team 3 where I actually got, got some combat. You were participated in the, in the preparatory part of the pre part of what might be commonly known by people here as the as the surge you were in anbar province and ramadi being the the major city and the most dangerous city in the world at that time i mean what was it like to go from training to be transported right in you know it's um it's something that you train for all the time and you dream about getting into um you know i remember getting to the team and there were guys who were getting close to retirement that had never shot their gun in combat um and they were they they were frustrated. Um, so having the opportunity to get to combat, you know, intense combat, your first appointment is, um, you know, they don't write scripts that better than that. And you're right. It was the pre-surge. You know, we had changed a lot of the models of how we would engage Al Qaeda at that time to more of a tribal engagement, which is how Ramadi played out in a lot of those towns in, in Western Iraq and the um, Anbar province. We would, use our skill sets, direct action missions, sniper overwatch, et cetera, in addition to winning the hearts and minds and, and showing the locals that not only are we going to smash the enemy that's ravaging both coalition forces and the local populace, but we're going to you know, help stabilize that region um, and, and allow for the potential uh, to self-government you know, long after, after uh, we leave. And as, you know, as that surge rolled through, you, know, you saw a lot of those um, – those imprints uh, for for a little bit after after coalition forces left. I think one of the really important reasons to read books that are written by those who are who are in the field is uh, people in political discussions or talking about foreign policy or what we decide to do as voters or what we urge our leaders to do. You know, it's always very in such simplistic terms. You know, I'm for the war, I'm against the war. We shouldn't do this, we should do that. And I think it's important to see the nuances and the dimensions of it. It's like not just about do we fight a war, but how do we fight it? And something like your your book kind of reveals different strategies. Uh, For instance, you mentioned that David Petraeus' strategy was clear, hold, and build. 
you were the clear part. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate. That's the way you know our our society's evolved. I mean, you look at ESPN for example. I mean, there are talk shows that talk about other talk shows and <laughs> analyze other talk shows. Um, right. And if you really want to make the discussion as who's better, LeBron James or Michael Jordan, why don't you put their films side by side and watch them yourselves? And I feel the same has evolved with our politics and particularly how we engage in foreign policy. Um, you know, the talking heads at nine, eight, nine uh, Eastern aren't going to tell you how we're really fighting the war. They're going to stoke your 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 uh, your inner passions. Um, you're going to get how wars are conducted from the spoken word and the written word from those who have actually been there. And um, you know, part of the strategy that we use that you know a lot in the media won't let you hear is that we were very successful in what we did. Um, and Ramadi was one of those um, was one of those uh, models of success where we were a part of you know first the five zero. Five or six, um, the army and the marines, um, and we were part of that clear phase. And that clear phase involved destroying the enemy, uh, plainly speaking, uh, while minimizing, you know, casualties and collateral um, to show them that our focus is the enemy and not, you know, an Iraqi city as a whole. And um, you know, the hold is the occupancy, and then the build is building the um, not only the external structure but the infrastructure which comes through security um, that's crucial in that clear phase. And one of the problems is if they're trying to do build or hold before there's a clear, uh, it goes without saying that there's there's going to be people in there who don't have good intentions disrupting everything. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, war, is, it, war is violent. It has to be. And in that process of clearing, you know, you, you're, you're engaging, you know, some very nefarious characters, um, heinous, evil people. And um, it has to be very swift and decisive. And I think the more waffling that happens, um, the more instability you you set the stage for later on. And fortunately, um, the Marines and the Army that we worked with, um, they didn't hesitate. Neither did we. And we were able to, you know, with ruthless accuracy, target the enemy and really, um, you know, put a damper on their day to the point that Ramadi was given a opportunity, which it did for a short period of time, to you know, be be free, be safe, um, and then set itself up for uh, hopefully, which you know hasn't occurred in recent years, a long term success. As you were noting in your book that you even felt that the Iraqi army that you had served with, and in the beginning they were they were very spirited, but you had to help them a bit, and you felt that they were even getting better. When we go overseas and we work to to train local you know, militias or armies, special operations groups, I mean. It results in on-the-job training, which means eventually you're going to have to go out into, you know, the enemy's area outside the wire and use the skill sets. And if you didn't train these people properly, you know, it's a liability because they may not cover their sticks and you make it shot at. Um, and we took our training very seriously. And, and at first, you know, the Jundies were a little slow to react. You know, there's the language barrier. There's the culture mm -hmm. barrier. Um, but as we engaged in combat and both sides lost, you know, soldiers, um, the Jundies and us, you know, they realize that we all have the same skin in the game. And um, after that, that learning curve was right up on par and those guys carried their weight. And when you operated, and, and it's often maybe a perception that people may have of a sniper, it's like, well, they're, they're uh, hidden and the enemy can't see them. So it's a very, it's a, that's obviously a very uh, aggressive, uh, offensive military stance. But it might be misunderstood by some folks, and you, you talk about this in the book. I mean, you have rules of engagement that you operate by. For instance, uh, someone has a weapon, uh, someone even having a cell phone. If they're taking a certain amount of peaks at your position, they're now in it. Or someone making a booby trap or a device like that. So there's many rules of engagement that, that you operate by in order to accomplish that clear phase. Yes. And, um, you know, any military, you know, from, from the United States can be, uh, any part of the military from the U S can be as savage as you want or as docile as a, as a lap dog. And it really stems from the rules of engagements that are put forth by politicians. Um, fortunately the rules of engagements that we received in the mid two thousands in Iraq were very, um, bent on winning. And what that translated down to the operator with the gun was if it's a hostile target and there is um, 
direct or indirect threats, you know, you're, you're able to engage, you know, hostile intent versus hostile action. And that means to the operator, if I see a guy with a gun, then, you know, that's, that's a, that's a greenlit target right there. Um, if I see a, a, a potential enemy combatant with a cell phone, you know, pointing out positions or with, you know, binoculars pointing out positions or setting up more tubes or directing, you know, coordinated attacks, that is uh, hostile intent, which deems, you know, hostile action on, the, on our part. And um, that means, you know, what, what that boils down to for us is you have to be good at your job because we're not a lawnmower that cuts every single blade of grass out there. That's mm-hmm. not how we operate. We're not savage like the enemy is. What we are is we're very skilled sur- surgical units that um, are able to differentiate the hostile intent versus hostile action versus non-combatants and how we were able to win you know, the job on the streets was killing the enemy. How we were able to win the PR war was not killing innocent civilians indiscriminately. Um, and that is how you beat an enemy. One, at the game that they, you know, bring to you, which is hostile intent, hostile action, and two, the PR war, which they can't put on uh, Al Jazeera and say they're killing our civilians. And uh, you did accomplish missions like rescuing kidnap victims of important people Correct. I mean, we rescued the the police chief's son who was uh, captured by Al Qaeda. They took him to Syria, um, and then brought him back into Iraq, and we snatched him um, in, uh, in in downtown Ramadi. Um, you know, he was mm-hmm. he was up on a rooftop, and we went in there and, and snatched him. And, you know, that's that's the thing is like, there's so many stories that that go to um, you go into the history of the Iraq War and the bond that has been formed between you know um, the American military and you know not only the Iraqi military, but even Iraqi civilians. Um, you know, I, I can guarantee you that, that, uh, police chief's son that we rescued in 2006, um, you know, was definitely a big supporter of what we did. Um, you know, when given the face with the savage nature of his captors. You carried the American flag with you into battle every day. I did. Um, I did for a couple different reasons. I carried it, you know, with the intention of one day flying it and then presenting it to my family. I um, carried it as a as a backup via 17 panel in case mm-hmm. I lose mine. Um, and you know, there was always that that uh, opportunity to um, intimidate the enemy, um, and we used that in one opportunity while our foot patrol on the ground was taking effective fire. Um, our sniper Overwatch, which couldn't get a clear line of sight of the enemy, wanted them to move a little bit. So we simply attached the American flag to a um, to a pole and started flying it over our position, which mission accomplished, directed enemy fire and took it away from our guys on the ground. And we were able to to uh, work on engage the um, the aggressors. I noticed that there's all of these uh, very they seem like small things that you read in the book. But I think they could be they, they seem so important and they could be life lessons really for for everyone. Things like take care of your gear, and it will take care of you. You you always seem to be adjusting gear all throughout the all throughout your experience. Or uh, complacency kills. Exactly. You know, my my son comes home after fishing and wants to just chunk his fishing rod in the corner of the garage and wait. Hopefully, next time it you know it it uh it works the same way it it did that first time, and I have to show him that you know. There are things you need to take care of because eventually you may come to rely on these things. And if you don't take care of them previously, you know, they say a previous pro- previous proper planning prevents a piss poor performance. I have to let them know that you prep your gear because you're going to need it later on down the road. Um, and that's true. And, you know, it's basic. Yeah, everybody knows that. But complacency, um, it's not just if I get complacent on the battlefield, I'm going to die. You know, that's, that's an opportunity. That's a possibility. But, you know, I look at it. It's a healthcare provider. If I get complacent in my job and I don't mm-hmm. take you know, each interaction, each time I deal with a patient um, with the same vigor I did that first time that I spoke to them or I interacted with them, well, I could miss something, and that can be detrimental to the patient. Um, you know, same. It can be applied to every single aspect of your life, and I think um, you know, being in combat makes you an active uh, participant in life compared to a passive passenger um, who's more uh, susceptible to environmental factors and, um, you know, being in combat heightens your situational awareness. Um, and I think it, it prepares you better for the unknown. Um, whereas the opposite is for those that are, uh, complacent.
And a reminder that I'm talking with Kevin Lace, the author of The Last Punisher, a SEAL Team 3 sniper's true account of the Battle of Ramadi. He also served with Chris Kyle, the subject of the movie American Sniper, and Kevin starred in that movie playing himself. What was it like then to go from having served the deployments in uh, Ramadi back to civilian life? Yeah, it's pretty... um... It was a pretty smooth transition. Um, you know, I've been a very linear thinker my entire uh, my entire life, and I set, you know, I prep the next thing, you know, while I'm finishing up something else. And you know, my the next logical step was, you know, I, I met my my wife while I was in the Navy, um, and I joined in 2002 with the, you know, I wanted to serve my country, I wanted to engage the enemy, I wanted to go to war. Um, I did two combat deployments. I checked every box that I wanted to, and I felt that the next step was to go back to school and pick up on something I had dropped before. So I applied to school. I wrote my uh, entry letter to the University of Connecticut while I was in combat and, you know, on the Syrian border town um, in western Iraq, you know, just stating, I know I was a, 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 a derelict my first time, but, you know, I've learned a lot these uh, last seven years. You know, I'd love the opportunity to attend the institution. And um, somebody did mittens on us. I never met them. They bought it and they took me on and I got a spot at UConn. So not three months after getting out of the Navy, um, four months after getting out of combat, I was enrolled at UConn. And it was seamless to the point where I felt comfortable in this next step. And then I felt uncomfortable being with a bunch of, you know, you know, you know that movie Billy Madison where he goes back yes. to school <laughs> of course, and he's yeah. stuck with like the kindergartners. Right. Yeah, that was kind of like how I felt when we were when we were back in the classroom, and I'm dealing with you know, children who had never experienced real life or war or healthcare or any of those things that I dealt with on a daily basis. Um, and then I felt like I had made the wrong choice. <laughs> but uh, like I said, I, I met my wife, and she um, she reassured and kept me strong. And a, a lot of those moments where I felt weak. I didn't know I was doing the right thing because I had buddies who were still, you know, in, in the teams. I had friends who, um, you know, had been been there when, when you know, Operation Neptune Spear occurred and guys had got bin Laden, the same reason why I joined the Navy. And you know, I wondered, is being a college student and then becoming a PA, is this the right course where I was ready being a SEAL? Why didn't I stay in? But, you know, um, I saw the forest for the trees and, um, you know, continued my undergrad, and then went to grad school, and here I am today as a PA. And your wife helped you with the book. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when we were putting this thing together, Ethan and I got together and you did a bunch of interviewing and writing, and um, it came across as, you know, Ethan's a fantastic writer, um, but it came across as being a very guy-oriented thing. And, and Lindsay, her interjections and her you know queries and questions were so specific, and they brought so much to the book. Like, what did you feel in this situation? And mm. sometimes I felt nothing. And she's like, you need to convey that you felt nothing in this situation. Or I had a lot of emotion. And I felt that made the book more robust and it increased the readership of the book. Cause it's not just a, a war memoir. It also, you know, has the reader think a little bit, how does this theme, you know, um, you know, relate to my life. And also the chapter introductions were Lindsay's and they set the the theme for the book. So not only was she spectacular and, you know, keeping me focused after I got out of the military, you know, she's been my partner in crime and she's a fantastic co-writer for this book. Well, I think that the contributions work because I really do think this book puts the reader in it. It's certainly not fiction, but it has the dramatic elements like, you know, we're going up the stairs with you and we don't know what we're going to find on that rooftop. Uh, your wife also was the one that contacted the writer I believe, for American Sniper. Yeah, you know, she got me into that mess, so I keep telling her it's all your fault. <laughs> so so I was, I was enrolled at the at Wake, Forest Univers, uh, at Wake Forest, and um, I was starting PA school in late June while Lindsay was still in Connecticut finishing up teaching. Uh, she was teaching high school history. And I moved down early so I could get set. I moved all the worldly possessions we had into our rental house in North Carolina. I left Lindsay in Connecticut with our son, um, a laptop and an air mattress in the house that we still own. So she happens to be on 
Facebook or whatever social media site and saw that Bradley Cooper's production company had bought the rights to American Sniper. And it had stated that Jason Hall was you know, listed as the screenwriter for the movie. So she went on Facebook and found Jason Hall. And there was a ton of Jason Halls, but only one had recently liked American Sniper the Facebook page. So she sent him a message shot in the dark and said, hey, this is a real personal story. And um, she used a little more colorful language. She's like, don't mess this up. So Jason was inquisitive and, and said, well, you know, I really want to get this story right. So help me don't mess this up. So they had a correspondence for about two months till Lindsay came down to North Carolina and we're sitting there having breakfast one morning. And I'm drinking my coffee. And, you know, she tells me, she's like, Hey, I, I met somebody. And I was like, say again, she's like, no, 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 it, it's all right. I, I met somebody online and it's cool. They're in Hollywood. And I was like, <laughs> well, you really don't know what I used to do. And she's like, no, 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 it's fine. His name is Jason Hall. He wrote, um, he's read the screenplay of American Cypher and he wants to talk to you about, you know, your role in that and in real life. And I was, you know, you know, I had to text Chris and be like, Hey, this is hall guy. All right. And Chris, Chris Kyle was like, yeah, Jason's fine. Why don't you talk to him? And that's how our relationship started, you know, talking about Mark Lee and Ryan Joe to Jason and helping Jason understand Chris because Chris was working with his company craft. And uh, the three of us worked on sniper until Friday before Chris was murdered the day before Chris was murdered. And that was when Jason finished the screenplay and delivered it to the producers. And the next day, Chris went to the range in Glen Rose and was murdered. Um, so Chris never got to read the the first uh, or any of the you know, scripts of American Sniper. So I invited Jason to come down to Texas and see the funeral and meet a lot of team guys. And he did and got a better understanding. And a lot of that you know, became the backbone of the movie American Sniper. When you watch it and you see you know, the real life stuff at the end and you know the funeral procession, that was all filmed with his iPhone. So Jason gets back to California, starts telling these producers, like, yeah, I had a great time. Yeah, I met this guy, Dauber. He's been working with me. He'd be make, he'd make a great technical advisor. And Bradley thought it was a great idea. So we'd set up a, we set it up a, um, a training day where I'd, I'd go teach him how to shoot. Spielberg was going to direct, and then Clint Eastwood eventually, you know, signs on. And I fly out to California. I meet Clint, um, have like a day long interview with him. And then, um, I go to the range the next day with Cooper and we're on the range and he's like, Hey, you ever think about playing yourself in the movie? And I was like, no, I was like, no, actually I'm not one of those, uh, like, you know, artsy kids. I didn't do any drama. He's like, no, it's fine. I'll teach you how to do it. You just, just audition. And I was really, I was like, well, let's get Chris Kyle's character correct. And then I'll consider that long story short, the casting director sent me the sides. Well, after I went back to North Carolina, back to grad school, I auditioned on an iPhone. My wife filmed me. Uh, we sent it into the casting directory, called back two days later, and uh, said, I shut the tapes to Clint. He loved it. He said, boy, he's damn good. Get him a job. And next thing you know, two weeks later, I'm in Morocco filming American Sniper. What was it like going from uh, having done this to being in a movie, you know, playing playing the role that you you had had done in real life? Bruce, the question the question you should be asking is how how is it feeling like going from a full time grad program right onto a movie set? <laughs> and it, it was it was crazy. You know, I, I'm you know, I'm in my uh neuro psych block of, of physician assistant school at Wake Forest and then next thing you know, I'm in a movie set in Morocco filming the combat scenes that you see in American Sniper. I mean it uh, it wasn't that much of a difference. You know, it, it was a huge difference, but it wasn't as dramatic as like a lot of people, you know, infer. Um, there's a big difference between combat and movie set. You know, when you're in combat, you better have a camel back. You're not going to drink any water. If you're on a movie set, you just got to whistle to the, uh, the production assistant who's, who's going to run you over a bottle of water. So it's the differences are stark. Um, but I think um, a lot of people brought a lot to the America, uh, American Sniper set. Um I feel my contribution was with the actors coaching them and teaching them, you know, how combat actually goes and why this movie is important because these individuals not only had a big you know, part of my life, Mark Lee, Ryan Job, Mike Monsoor, Chris Kyle, um, but a lot of SEALs and a lot of people who were on the streets while we were in the sniper overwatches who, you know, a lot of them have come forth and said, you know, Chris saved their life in a lot of occasions. Those people, this story is about them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my job was simply to convey to them what 
that bond means to a lot of people and so that they can take their actions and bring it bring their A game to the silver screen and and they did. Talk a bit about Chris Kyle, the other people that you served with, what what they were really like. Did the movie do them justice? You know, SEAL Team Three, Charlie Platoon, Tasking a Bruiser, I, I mean it's it's just a phenomenal set of individuals. You know, obviously, you know, people know about Chris and and his um you know, what what he's done, you know, you read American Sniper, you know, read about the 200 some odd confirmed kills he had, and and a lot of people see that. Um, I mean, Chris was my friend, um, so I saw him on a. It's weird to see and hear your friend as a household name, um, mm-hmm. but Chris was a down to earth guy who had a very amazing skill set and was able to teach people around him how to be at the level he was, and that in turn made us snipers and our team more effective in combat. Um, you know, Mark Lee and Ryan Joe were fantastic. You guys, guys that, you know, I cut my teeth with at the teams. Uh, we grew up together and, you know, unfortunately Mark, you know, spent his last hours, days, minutes next to me in a, in a, in a crappy house in Iraq and Ramadi, um, when he was killed on August 2nd and Ryan Joe was injured that day. And unfortunately Ryan died as a result of surgery, um, in 2009. So, you know, those guys are to see them come to life on the on the big screen is is great because people are hearing those stories. Um, Mike Monsoor was our sister platoon mate who in Delta platoon who jumped on a grenade and received the Medal of Honor. So guys have you know become these mythical people um, based on their actions and having known them as hey that's Mike or that's Mark or that's Biggles. You know, it, it's kind of surreal. And you know, more recently. Um, my fellow medic in Charlie Platoon, uh, Johnny Kim, just got selected to the astronaut program. Um, so he went from being a SEAL to uh, USD to Harvard Med and just got picked up for the astronaut program. So to see the enlisted guys just absolutely set these, um, you know, huge standards mm-hmm. and, and meet them and go beyond that um, has been incredible. It's been humbling. And it goes back to, you know, the teams and the people that you surround yourself with. If you surround yourself with the right people, they will push you harder and harder to make yourself better. And together, you make a fantastic team, and that's what we did. One of the things I read, I believe it was in the Navy Times, that you had said is that, uh, and it just goes to uh, how we react. Sometimes you'll have people who might say, you know, thank you for your service. and But what you didn't like is if they said something like, I'm sorry you had to go through all that. And your your reaction was, you know, sorry, this was a great experience in my life. Yeah, you know, um, that's kind of the impetus of why we wrote The Last Punisher. You know, I um, I got done with Sniper, and I had friends of mine that I grew up with who said exactly that. Thanks for your service, and I'm sorry you had to go through all that. Um, and I didn't I didn't know what what I should do is like default and like knock them out real quick and make sure they're okay. <laughs> or educate them and say, this is something I wanted to do. Like, while you stayed in college, like I wanted to be a team guy. I wanted to go to combat and I understood the risk associated with that. And I felt those questions were kind of a microcosm of the greater narrative with veterans. And I think, um, you know, like I said, to write a book, I, I never set out to, I never wanted to write a seal book. I never Mm -hmm. thought that my life was, you know, you know, kind of book worthy, but I felt when I read these different accounts that nobody was addressing, you know, the elephant in the room, which is everybody thinks that if you go overseas, you're going to have PTSD. And that is very detrimental to veterans in general. Um, So when writing the book, you know, we don't take anything away from people who have PTSD. PTSD is very real. It affects about 20 percent of veterans coming back. Um, I have friends who have PTSD and I know it's not something to uh, gloss over. But I do believe that are we addressing it correctly? And um, I, I feel, you know, we don't in a lot of ways. And I feel you know, a lot of that is very close to home. I, Chris Kyle was murdered by a guy who the media initially painted out to be somebody with PTSD, not the, you know, the guy who's on drugs. That's crazy, you know, narrative, because, man, it's easier. It's easier to talk about veterans with PTSD than to call out a, na- a national drug pop problem or you know, the mental health conditions in this country, that's a bigger issue. So let's just focus on PTSD. So I felt like we are not addressing the issues correctly. So in writing this book, I want to talk about the 80% who go to combat and come back and don't suffer the effects of PTSD because people with and without PTSD are doing great things each and every day to further veterans and to further, you know, 
people who have been in these situations and may not have been in combat, but they're first responders or law enforcement. Um, and they do a lot of great things every day. So when we look at how we treat P- people with PTSD, um, you know, I think we're making a lot of, a lot of efforts. You know, there's a lot of focus on, you know, those who, who take their lives each day, every, uh, you know, the 22 kill movement, they, they talk about that. Um, but I feel that, you know, as a healthcare provider, and I say this very objectively as a healthcare provider and as a veteran that, you know, the help is available. If you call the VA right now and they say, are you in crisis? You call 911 and, you know, there is so much help out there. Um, and we do the best that we can, you know, it comes down also to the individual. If you want help? And that's where the humanism comes in. Like either I'm an individual and I don't want help or I do want help. Um, so I believe we have met that in a lot of different ways. I've seen how employers have stepped out and made, you know, employment easier for veterans. Um, and then I've seen veterans mess it all up and, you know, that's their own fault. And it's unfortunate because there are people that go out of their way to do great things for veterans and then veterans undo it. And we get all get lumped into that one group. So it comes down to the individual. Do you want help or not? Are you going to go ahead and make a good name for veterans or not? And uh, anything that, that, that individual people should be doing uh, both in how they how we behave towards veterans, but also what we might want to advocate to our elected officials. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're not, we're not monsters that have like you know, hands going out of our face or anything like that. I think, um, you know, um, I think it begins with, you know, the, the honest talk about the military, you know, I'm from a state, you know, um, where you, you're in Jersey, right? Jersey. Yeah. Connecticut, New Jersey, you know, you join the military. It's kind of like, Ooh, what happened to that guy? Like, why is he going in the military? And there aren't very many people I know from Connecticut that joined the military. One of my, one of the, um, one of my grooms in my, in my wedding was a uh, SEAL officer from Jersey. Um, but he's like one of the only guys I know from Jersey that joined the military. Um, it comes down to that honest conversation. There's nothing wrong with joining the military. I've gone ahead. If you put me side by side with people I went to college with initially, you know, I've superseded them in a lot of different ways. And so have my peers that have joined the military. And I think, you gain life lessons that a lot of people will never have if they don't join the military and do that. And I think having an honest conversa- conversation and saying there's nothing wrong with the military. It's a great way to, you know, improve your life and go beyond and learn more about yourself. Um, and that fixes the narrative on how we address veterans, because if you're from that population of, Ooh, why'd you join the military? Then we see veterans as that group as how do we fix those people? Or how do we help those people? Because they're not really, those people, they're us, aren't they not? So I think it begins with how we view people who join the military, how how we promote the military, and how we support the military, um, both in war and then also on the home front. Um, I've seen great things. I do a lot of speeches with uh, companies who are veteran-friendly. Um, I believe there are initiatives made each and every day that make it easier for veterans, but I think at the same time, we don't look for handouts as veterans. You know, we I want to, when I apply to a physician assistant school, whether it's Duke, Emory, or Wake Forest, I want to be judged, not just because I'm a veteran, but how smart am I? And am I really going to pass this program? And I think that comes up to the veteran where it's time that you stepped up to the plate when you're in combat, step up to the plate when you get out and set the standard like you continue to do. And I'm proud to call myself a veteran and I see veterans doing great things every day. In magazines, those articles on great CEOs and titans of industry, but when people need to also look at look at what this person accomplished in the military, this might be a great a person that's going to handle those challenges extremely well. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I'm like I said, I, I remember, you know, looking at some of my peers when I, you know, shut down college in 2001 and, and transitioned to the military. And those guys went off. And while I was in the Navy, you know, some of them became doctors and they did great things. And I look at what I've done in those years since. And, um, you know, I'm in that healthcare world, you know, I own clinics, I work as a public speaker, I have a book out and all of that would not have happened had I not challenged myself in the military. And I think there, it's a lot of positives to that. And I think, um, you know, if you ever, if you ever doubt that, just, just look at Johnny Kim, he's an astronaut right now. Let's talk a bit about you have a charity hunting for healing. I do. Um, my partner in crime helped, helped us start it. My, my wife, Lindsay, um, you know, she's really been, um, you know, we talked about transition. She's been my swim buddy, you know, as I got out, you know, in the teams, you always have to swim. Buddy. Well, when I got out, um, 
you know, the teams weren't right there because they're in Virginia or California and I was in Connecticut and then Lindsay was really, you know, uh, she picked up a lot of that slack and um, we have a great relationship. We communicate a lot. And one of the things I like to do in my off time is to hunt. I love to hunt and fish. I grew up fishing a lot, got into hunting while I was in the military. Um, I do a lot of those, both of those a lot to this day. And one of the trips that I took her on was to Africa. Um, I've been to Africa before, and the first time I went was in 2012, and I wanted to bring my wife on the next trip. So I did in 2014, and she got to see why I like to hunt. It's not just shooting the animal. It's the preparation process. It's the deer camp. It's the stories. It's the hunt. It's coming back and the whole, you know, um, uh, uh, event. And um, she felt that that was a powerful experience where we got off the grid in Africa. We communicated. We wrote this book. We started writing this book. And um, she harvested an animal, and she felt that this would be a great connection for spouses and veterans. And we launched Hunting for Healing, which is a 501c3 charity. We take veterans and their spouses on hunting, fishing, outdoor activities. We recently got back from a seven-day plains antelope hunt in Africa. That was our main goal when we started this, was to go back to Africa and share that experience. And we were able to do that um, two years later. We took an Army veteran, he was a ranger, lost, lost both his legs, and an Air Force UD veteran, him and his spouse, um, took them and their spouse to Africa. They hunted. We've been to Costa Rica, catching billfish and, and uh, tuna. Been to Chalmette, Louisiana, duck hunting. Been alligator hunting in Louisiana. We've got a bunch of trips in the near future um, and a bunch of veterans that we've been taking out. It's been super rewarding, you know, uh, for me, but I know even more so for Lindsay, and she's really taken it as her passion project and has done great things. Do you have a website for that if people want to learn more or perhaps donate? You can check all this stuff out at uh, www.kevinlace.com. That'll have information and links to our charity, which is uh, Hunting for Healing. So it's www.huntingforhealing.org. And you can learn more about the organization. You can go ahead and donate. Um, and even importantly, you can go ahead and take those applications and pass them out to um, veterans that you know that could benefit from some of our trips. We're a very small charity. We um, we have a uh, couple of um, two seals that I worked with. The one that is from New Jersey on the board, and another friend of mine, and then an Air Force pilot and um, former Air Forceman, and then um, an airman and a local firefighter. So we're all very active, and um, we look forward to taking more vets on the trips. I was joined today by Kevin Lace, the author of The Last Punisher, a SEAL Team 3 Sniper's true account of the Battle of Ramadi. Kevin, thanks for what you've done for the country, and thanks for coming on my podcast today. Bruce, I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank Kevin Lace for coming on the program today. We will have a link to his book, The Last Punisher, on the website at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Also remember his charity, huntingforhealing.org. And you go to that website, both if you want to donate and help out the project, or if you want to get an application that you can hand to a veteran that you might know. Thanks for listening.